Uh, growing up on the Wind River Reservation of Wyoming, Wyoming uh, in the United States uh, produces more energy per capita than anywhere else in the world, whether that be coal, oil, or fat gas. And with that, you know, um, the conception of Wyoming is based off of, you know, resource and mineral extraction that I grew up at, uh, born into it, um, born into, uh, because they were stealing it before we were even getting, you know, our piece of the pie. So there became a point in time when we got considered oil and gas tribe. And now, uh, you know, not only fighting the, the fossil fuel industry um, that's around us, but, you know, that has, that's also been embedded and conditioned into uh, our tribal government, you know, the ones who run everything. And so, um, you know, growing up on the reservation, I grew up at a housing project that was right behind the housing project was the our tribe's oil and gas fields and a lot of our family you know um we 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 have health problems um and to know that like the rivers that you know we used to play in as kids that they were being used for industrial runoff um and my mom you know living in a house that's about a mile and a half away from a yellow cake factory uh, in the 60s, they started mining uranium in this area, and they left the tailings um, on the reservation through loopholes. And because of that, uh, now the groundwater is contaminated. It, um, it's ruined. It has uh, radioactivity. And so the water has to get pumped into this community that I live in, in Big Wind. And so dealing with that at a very young age, um, noticing the environmental racism because we grew up on the south part of the Wind River and the people on the north part of the Wind River, you know, my uh, on this side, you know, you see trailer parks and housing projects. And then on the north side, you see golf courses and uh, a white settlement town that uh, doesn't have those. They're very protected and insulated because they don't have to worry about those things um, because they're not on reservation land, you know. Yeah, and, Is that and your question mark. Yes, yes, it does. Of course, it does. It, 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 what's what was interesting in the previous conversations that we've had was also that, you know, how I discovered you was um, I I was trying to find out what was happening during COP twenty five, and um, of course, you know, kind of anticipating that um, indigenous voices were there, but not really included into these decision processes right. and you posted these very pregnant uh videos and not only you mentioned that but you had also something to say about ngos that you know that for me and and I, i've seen that for a long time that are also part of the problem yeah i mean it's the nonprofit industrial complex in general i feel like you know uh, indigenous people, especially, we haven't been involved in a lot of these conversations. Uh, you know, I'm privileged enough to be able to start having these conversations, uh, conversations that have never been had before in a local, regional, um, with their global uh, tables, you know, and so I feel like I started getting involved in uh, water protection, land defense. And then uh, that led to me wanting to know more about policy work. And so I've been uh, trained on how to figure out how we can implement traditional ecological knowledge into climate mitigation and action plans. And so that's why I was at COP25 um, with a group of all indigenous young people uh, trying to get our voices heard at the, so that you know we're at the table so that we're not on the menu and i know that uh, a lot of indigenous people uh, around the world are doing the same thing you know and so you know when talking about tech and um whatnot like i feel like the thing is, is that ngos and nonprofits they're always going to continue to throw money at this problem, climate change. Um, when indigenous people, we have knowledge that is so old that has still has the holds the land 
this land's, you know, sacred and sees that, you know, when talking about how we view uh, our mitigation plans, you know, trying to put them in matrices and weighing out, you know, what are our highest resources putting what are the uh what is the most uh, vulnerable species and what is the most marketed species and you know as indigenous people we know that you know it's more than just key resources and key species because those are all our relatives you know um and so trying to talk about that you know and get tech you know into climate mitigation plans so that we are safeguarded not only at the these global climate talks but uh you know state and regional climate uh, climate action plans yeah yeah and and i want to jump to diara because i know you traveled the world <laughs> and and to to bring that voice of indigenous people of brazil of the amazon and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure that what Big Wind just shared resonates with you in, in, in your own experience of not only expressing your indigeneity, but also uh, how this traditional knowledge is so important in these conversations. Mm, well, I'd like to present myself a little bit more, I am coordinator of an indigenous radio here in Brazil that is called Radio Yande. And uh, we have more than 350 indigenous nations here. It's not just only in the Amazon, that is just one of uh, a lot of uh, misconceptions of indigenous uh, Brazilian. <laughs> and um, we are part of a generation that is trying to get our uh, rights implemented. The generations of, my, of our fathers fought for to, to have democratic indigenous rights. Uh, the generations of, of our grandfathers went to boarding schools. They had all the languages prohibited. And while well, we share this experience in the whole Americas and to the whole continent, and uh, today we try to use technologies, especially the, te the communication technologies to share um, our perspectives, not only denouncing what is happening because there is a lot of uh, human rights violations and uh, nature rights violations as well, uh, but also sharing what we do of positive, like valuing our culture, our languages and uh, rising up our um, pride to be indigenous because uh, we have gone through centuries of um, genocide. The genocide is still going on, especially at this moment in Brazil, we are facing a government that is publicly anti-indigenous uh, with lots of hate speeches against us and that is doing everything that they can to dismantle all of our rights and all of the institutions that are supposed to deal with the uh, indigenous politics. And um, so for me, I believe for, for our generation, uh, we used to say in Brazil that it's important to remember to be like good ancestors now we have this responsibility to not let our culture die, to not surrender, to never uh, forget uh, where we came from and uh, to have the courage and the dedication and the discipline we need to um, uh, receive uh, the, um, the lessons and the memory of our grandfathers to pass it on and try to find a good dialogue uh, with the next generations of other nations. Um, I, I always say that it's really funny and kind of sarcastic when they, they uh, try to, to talk to us to see if the indigenous nations have like the answer to save the world of something as, as if we were like, uh, I don't know, uh, 
fairies from the forest from a magical world that has lots of solutions and, and that is so uh, crazy and so immature uh, we are facing a pandemic right now and it's not the first time for us maybe this time at least you are together with us but we know that world has ended many times and we knew how to survive and we knew uh, all the time we we don't forget we never forget that it's important to respect nature and to follow all the rhythms of life and we never forget that we are related to everything that is around us like the rivers and the mountains and the animals we are not ashamed we don't think humankind is better than a fly of a cockroach you know and uh, so uh, i i i i also laugh a lot when we talk about decolonization i am more for counter colonization i am more anti colonialist uh, because i think uh, the colonization is a uh, is something like those that need to decolonize are those that thought that they have colonized anything. It's all illusion. All the borders, all these charts, all these politics, these are illusion. Illusion is full of illusion. And uh, the best way to decolonize is try to share our perspectives uh, to how to relate to the world, like speaking more and thinking more in our indigenous ways and now i am talking in english with you we are talking in english this is not my native language uh, i could be talking in portuguese that is either my native language but i believe that you need to understand some concepts of indigenous nations how we see um uh, how we think, for example, that is the, the thinking, the thought. There is an indigenous word I, I used in my human rights uh, research. I am a researcher on human rights, uh, on the right to memory and truth of indigenous nations. And I, I, I was struggling with the university because they only wanted me to to quote like white people and speak Latin and Greek and that didn't make sense to me and um, I tried to explain that for our nations uh, the thought like the Shina the Shina is the thinking the even the thought is different because our thought is alive is alive when we think when we pray when we sing we have a positive and alive living thinking that that can transform reality that is how we perceive the world our world is more large than the physics or the metaphysics we understand time in a different way we understand the humankind and nature in a different way and it's not impossible to the rest of the humanity to do it together. What is ending right now may be the privilege, may be uh, the capitalism. What is ending right now may be this uh, amnesia, amnesia of a culture that has forgot that every single nation has indigenous roots and that those roots are on our land, our ship, our canoe that is our planet and everything is related and us we are related as well between ourselves that's it and i i really need to go soon i'm so sorry for that <laughs> wow that's a lot to unpack <laughs> but thank you so much Deva. Whew. I'm yeah, you know, it. as you know, you, you, you're French, and in France they are talking about effondrement. Uh -huh. I don't know how you say it in English, like uh, the crumbling, crumbling of this. Yeah, crumbling, effondrement. Uh -huh. And um, 
French indigenous nations, like at least when I read when I when I read Asterix, <laughs> they talk a lot about the falling of the sky. And oh. here uh, there is a indigenous nation that is the Yanomami nation that talks also about the falling of the sky. Uh, and they say that uh, it is the shamans, it is the medicine man, it is uh, that are holding the sky. And um, there are many people that don't understand what they are saying, but the, the medicine man, the indigenous knowledge holds the sky when it relates to the sky, when they can pay attention, when they are able to feel every single little subtle energy of the cosmos, of what is around. And that is science, that is knowledge as well. Uh, we are not those uh, funny fairy tales from the forest. We are civilizations. We are the possible civilizations that we can rebuild together. And nature and life on the planet will still go on. I don't know if we as individuals will survive like right now, of course, because in Brazil we are very much more in the, I don't know how you say it in, in English. Sorry, my English is not good enough. Um, like, uh, Philip, Philip is here somewhere, so if you say it in, oh, in Portuguese, maybe uh, it can like, help. Uh, grupo de risco, like the risk groups, yeah. when they are talking. Risk groups, yes. Yeah. yeah? We, as indigenous, we have been uh, in this group of group risk, of risk. risk group for more than 500 years. Yeah. We still are. We are we have been put under the risk of contamination by many diseases that we are still facing today. We have not access to health politics, to security politics, to education politics, to nothing of that. And we are uh, concerned as well, but our concer cons concerning, we are not worried about the end of economy. We are not worried about that. We are worried about the continuation of our culture, of our life, of our existence and our thoughts. And um, I believe this is the responsibility of our generation right now. And I hope um, if one day I have grandchildren, they, they won't consider themselves as just descendant of indigenous grandmothers. I hope that they still keep the memory and the, the pride to be a Tucano and to be an indigenous and to defend their lands. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Diora. Yeah, I just, I just because you were talking about Asterix and, and, and Obelix, I thought, well, you know, that's, it's, it's really interesting how my own culture, my own ancestry, has completely disappeared over time and been integrated. And there is so very little that is left of us as indigenous people. Uh, it started with the Roman invasion and, and behind me, I, I put this and it thought to be um, Senunos, who is a god of nature. Um, they, we're not even sure we had gods, <laughs> you know? so, so it's just an imagination and projection, but that's a very rare uh, depiction of someone holding time and connections with his surroundings. I'm just going to, to, bring, to bring myself down so you can saw it entirely. <laughs> So he's holding, he's holding a, a torque, he's holding a torque and he's holding a snake and, and, and yes, that is connection with everything around him, the plants, the animals. And I'm sure that, you know, if they, if they had put, able to put like a, a bee or something, there would be a bee. So if somebody looks closely, there might be a bee somewhere. Uh, but, but thank you. Yeah. It's, 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 um, it's, yeah, it speaks a lot. It speaks a lot. And, and, and Canyon, I, I, I see you. <laughs> no, like, 
the, the thing is not realizing if you have or not gods or if we have nature, but that we are nature. It's not to be connected. It's just to be. Precisely. Be nature. Precisely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was saying that because I feel that, you know, when the only, the only traces that we have of the goals is through the writings of Greeks, of Romans, so they came in with their own constructs and they looked at one people that were very different than them that, you know, the woman and the man will go to battle together very often naked. Um, and, and they could not understand that. They could not understand that. So they, they, they described these people in a certain way that uh, was not probably how they saw themselves. And how they saw themselves, as you mentioned, was really connected to everything. They never wrote anything. They knew how to write, but they never wrote anything. The writing became much later with, with Christians. So, you know, it's, but, but it is one of the things that I really wanted to talk about, you know, during, during this hour and a half was also, you know, how we, the dominant society, project what we think is, but is not. Right, and that leads to so many misconstructs, misunderstandings, and and very really terrible, you know, bank kind of awkward relationships that is not constructive to build something. You know, it's not. But 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 I know Canyon speaks beautifully about that, so I'm going to let her do that. <clears throat> so. Uh, yes, to everything that has been shared. Um, was the inquiry uh, how we reconnect to culture or in our journey? Um, I just need a rephrase to get my uh, tongue untied. Was that was uh, your inquiry? Was I think of that nature? Um, <clears throat> it was. It, it was. It was. It was also about you know resiliency, because there is resiliency, there is resurgence, there is reconnection. And I know that, that Marcus is going to, to present something for us, but to me, it's really, um, yeah, it, 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 it's things that you guys have been doing for 500 years and we just hear, you know, like, oh my God, there's this, this climate crisis that everybody's waking up for like about 10 or 15 years, right? And, and, and you've been at it like forever. So we have, we have so much to learn, right? And yes. we keep on reinventing and reinventing and thinking like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so I, I have to like lay down a little bit of a mini history lesson. Did you know that the Native American did not have right, the right to practice religion freely in Americas until 1978? That was the first time Native Americans had the right to practice religion freely. So it was illegal just to be Native. Did you know that the US government sanctioned genocide in, right before the gold rush in the 1850s? $5 a head, 50 cents a scalp for the eradication of the California Native. Yeah. But wait, I thought all media taught us that those Natives scalped the non-Natives. Oh, and so we have layers of history against indigenous peoples just for being. And then we have complacency presented in our education systems. And that's very problematic because when you offer this type of education to an entire nation, it dismisses these elements of truth and history that we can thoroughly learn from and be more appropriate in our approaches towards strategic steps towards sustainable futures. However, we in this post-industrial, post-colonial settler era are prioritizing the economy and prioritizing producing and consuming because we have divorced our responsibility to our connected, our intent, our connection and recognizing our kinship to nature and the environment. When my mother taught me, so um, rewinding, <clears throat> I was born and raised into this. <laughs> I didn't really, I don't really have much of a choice here. <laughs> like my mother told me like I could, you know, become a botanist and travel the world and do all this, that and the other. However, I'm very rooted in my community and from the land that I come from. And I recognize that privilege. I recognize 
how much of a privilege it is to be a Californian native woman living on the land of my ancestors, living where my grandmothers, 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 grandmothers have always been from, and being lucky enough to be on native land that my mother has opened up for all indigenous people who are in need of land for ceremony. So culture sharing and respecting and following indigenous protocol was the norm. I watched people come visit the land, coming with gifts and seeking permission to then participate or to facilitate gatherings and ceremonies. So I watched indigenous protocol unfold as a youth. This is very abnormal in today's post-colonial settler society in the 21st century, at least in the Americas. It's common in, in, in certain uh, spaces, however, in, in, like on reservations and on other territories of native land. However, for the greater populace of the Americas, mm -mm. indigenous peoples maintain less than 2% of the population of America, possibly 5% of the world. Yet we <clears throat> work with little to no resources to protect over 85%, possibly more, of the world's biodiversity with no res limited to no resources. And there are ways of behaviors that colonizers and settlers believe that their agenda is more important because profit is more important. Their very primitive, short-sighted decision-making practices are valued more than indigenous knowledges and holistic wisdoms and indigenous pedagogies that have been present here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. I visit classrooms and I say, <clears throat> we all heard the jingle, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I then ask, who did he run into? What were the names of their sacred waters, their sacred mountains? What language did they speak? What language did their neighbors speak? We can probably cite how many items were on these ships, the family lines of all of the beings on the ships, the supplies, the name of the damn ships. Yet it's been 530 plus years and we can't even acknowledge the indigenous peoples without having to use Google. There's a problem there. When we think about indigenous land management practices, they're barely ever acknowledged in these books because the books who are written by the supposed victors or the colonizers whose, perspective is our, whose perspectives are valued and validated with our Western settler science happen to say Native American hunter-gatherer. <clears throat> when in all actuality, traditional ecological knowledge has been used and maintains our integral relationship to the earth. We recognize all living systems from as simple as making an offering to a plant, letting it know where it's going, singing to it, caring about its water sources, caring about how it's being tended, recognizing holistic and ethical sustainable harvesting methods when interacting with it, tending the land with fire, with land management and stewardship, with fire ecology. These things are not known by the greater populace, however they were used, no less than we're traditionally still being used, still being used. However, Spaniards took over California 250 years ago. We just celebrated the Portola Ohlone expedition, the trail, and it's just like, whenever I see Portola Ohlone, it's kind of like saying like, mm, the Hitler Auschwitz trail. That's what it feels like. It's like, let's celebrate the history of it. Yeah, and you when you don't know all the elements of history, you're not recognizing how heavy that is. And so I am so honored to share space with these amazing beings, the people who are doing the work because, not because it is a job or a motivation or a passion or a hobby, it is what we are supposed to be doing. This, I never had a choice <laughs> and it's exhausting and I love what I do. I'm honored to hold this space. I'm exhausted to hold this space. I'm blessed to be able to witness community members, witness anything I share, and I'm humbled to hear feedback. I understand that there are some activists and community workers who do so very much and they may not get that kind of feedback loop 
like I, I, <clears throat> I have to use this example. I have an indigenous uh, relative who um, also works with a lot of her, her, uh, she, she, she's, she calls her, she sometimes says she's the uh, only black woman in the room. She's indigenous and black and she uh, works with well-intended white women who think they're doing the good work. And I have informed her that I, I'm, I'm lucky in my workshops to get a feedback of the community saying, what you said was so powerful. I have taken steps like A, B, and C in the work that I do to recognize and reflect what you, you exposed me to. And I, I informed her of this and she goes, oh my gosh, I need to be in the circles that you're in. Because she's been in, the circle, in these circles for 15 years and she hasn't been lucky enough to get that kind of feedback. And I could see how exhausting that could be, how tolling that could be, how laborious that is, just from as simple as the microaggressions and the denial of racism in today's settler colonial environment that supports a white supremacist culture. And it's painful. And so as a California native being, I, the way I, my tagline is, is I will do what I can, when I can, however I can, whatever I can, for as long as I can. I will <clears throat> continue to honor truth and history, to honor my ancestors to the best of my ability, and to be a good ancestor in training. So with that, that means I tend to say yes foolishly. I tend to exhaust my resources quickly. I know it comes back, however, it's intense. But I'm lucky to be on this journey with people where I get to create intentional community with those who are ready to take the steps. I also recognize there's a deep need to hit the circles of people who don't think this matters, who don't even care, because here I am, a person who identifies as a loney. And thanks to colonization, a loney is a misnomer. A loney didn't exist before the 1800s. So the indigenous peoples of whose land we are on, we can't even traditionally acknowledge them for who they are due to colonization because we have so little information. We do have plenty of information, however, available to the public, such limited information. And in California, we are the most linguistically dense. We have in excess of 250 language dialects in California alone. California still feeds the nation, yet many people when they think of California or when they say, are you Indian? Are you Native American? Like, what are you? What are you? I get really, fr yes, I'm Native passing, so I look Native. However, what about my relatives who don't stereotypically look like what the media has presented Indigenous peoples to look like? Because supposedly the people are such masters of supposedly knowing what Native people look like. So. I'm trying to point out that this behavior is imbued in everything. It is seeped into the very essence of what today's community is, allowing the media to present itself as smarter than, greater than, and more amazing than because it knows the narrative. So people try and tell me who I am or what I do or what I look like or what's this, what's that. And it's problematic because colonization is seeped into everything. How we look, how we present ourselves, even the word shaman. Our own nations and communities have our own words for doctors, healers, mm. medicine carriers. It's problematic because colonization, that, that word shaman came from nations further towards the Ivank people, which is over by Tibet, by Siberia. However, because a non-indigenous settler, possibly male, academic, wrote about it and presented it, it then get spread in the writings. And then even the community where that medicine carrier is from identifies as such because that has been the declarative. Oh, you're like a shaman, you're this, you're that. So we have generations of our own elders saying yes. And we have generations of elders bringing in espiritu, our spirit of religion, just to be accepted. And there's no frustration towards the elders who carry that. They have the right to say and present themselves however they want to. I have a problem with the missionaries who came and suppressed and had the tactic to oppress. So it's a very 
troublesome, struggling space as a two-spirited individual. And I attempt to use humor and I attempt to use my voice to the best of my ability to share this frustration and anger. And I'm still learning how to articulate my, my, myself and what I feel. So I'm still learning in this process. And so I do hope that it, if and when I continue to make enemies, that they understand that I'm growing and getting better <laughs> at articulating my issues. So I know I step on toes and I know I, I ruffle feathers. So uh, that's a little bit. <laughs> oh, but I, I, I mean, it's, it's the, that's what I ask you, right? To be yourself and, and not to worry because we need to have so many of these very uncomfortable conversations to break away from this Eurocentric mindset where suddenly, you know, white people are supposed, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, James Brown, this is a man's world. He forgot one word. This is a man, a white man's world, right? And, and that's, and that's how we've been raised, you know, from the very beginning. Europeans are a little bit more aware of the differences because like as French, you know, you get the Spaniards in the South, the Italian, the Swiss, the Bells, the Brits across the channels and everybody has tried to invade everybody um, at least once. Um, so so it's a, you come with a slightly different, but it's, we're still European. We're still the people who discovered America, right? And that's, I love, I love the response. Yes, at the time we discovered Columbus and it was not pretty. Um, so yeah, I, I, want, I want to give the floor to, to Marcus. Um, Marcus, he's, and, and I'm going to let you, you know, describe it because it's, it's so, it's so, uh, it brings a lot. You know, when I heard you, when I when I when I've read about what you're doing, both in terms of language revitalization, but also this eco village that 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 you're putting together, and um, as Diara was saying and Kenyon was saying as well, you know, all this is done with. You don't have much to work with to start with, right? And then you. That resiliency is, is very inspiring. So please, can you share with us? Sure. Um, I'll try to show um, a screen here, to share a screen um, in a moment. Uh, uh, I'll just share from uh, childhood first that uh, I kind of thought that the world was this flawless reality around me and that um, uh, our language and, and uh, cultural life ways were really strong. But um, actually, um, I, I, I do hear a, a lot of indigenous peoples talk about uh, traditional ecological knowledge and all these ways that, that we have. But, um, you know, the, the, the truth is that uh, we're really... Um, Kind of on the brink of extinction in a lot of contexts for 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 this um, traditional knowledge, and a lot of it is transmitted intergenerationally through language. And uh, as as language starts to um, decline in terms of number of speakers, um, that knowledge also exits the scene. So, um, when when I was younger, though, I um, oh well. Uh, a lot of people spoke our language. Uh, at least that was uh, seemingly the case. And then uh, when I um, became a teenager, uh, this linguist was hanging around the reservation that I lived on in, in uh, South Florida. And he said to me one day, um, oh, did the screen freeze? It's okay. Oh, you're good. Okay. Um, yeah, th th this linguist said to me, um, I always see you hanging out with old people and I don't see anybody uh, younger than you that speaks the language. That was the first realization that I had that, uh, that there was nobody younger than me that could speak our language. 
Um, and he said, are you interested in going to college? And I said, yeah, I'd like to go to college. And, and uh, nobody had ever been to college in my family. Um, and he said, are you interested in studying linguistics? And I said, what's linguistics? And he said, I'll take you to this conference at the University of Alabama. And I said, okay, let me think about it. And he said, uh, I'll let you drive my Jetta if you want to come. And I didn't have a, a license. And uh, so I thought that'd be a pretty good idea. So I uh, went uh, with him and the first night that we arrived at the at the conference um, this linguist sitting at the dinner table all the linguists of southeastern languages get together uh, regularly and and have conversations about what they're studying and this guy leans into me and he says do you L grade in first person past tense and then this woman leaned across the table and said um, uh, have you solved the EEP infix mystery and I, uh, I said, I don't know. I just talk Indian. I, this this woman um, that I was uh, met the following day, she came from uh, Oklahoma. She had worked with uh, this linguist that brought me. And and after 168 years of separation, um, my people have gone south, and her people have gone uh, been removed westward. Uh, we were still able to speak in our our language together, and that was a really evocative moment for me. Um, and and she said to me, you know, just because you speak your language doesn't mean that you can teach it. Uh, and that wasn't a concept I had ever really been exposed to. Um, and she said, if you want to come to the University of Oklahoma, uh, I'll teach you how to teach the language. And so I, you know, eventually made it to the university. And uh, she was interested in in um, linguistic grammar patterns. That's how her was her approach to language work. And I didn't have access to terms like imperialism or colonialism. And I just said, oh, that's white. I don't like it. And um, she said, uh, we'll just give it a try. And if you don't want to do it, keep doing it, you can quit. So I um, uh, started to, to give it a shot. And in the process of looking at the language through these grammar patterns, I gained the ability to extrapolate traditional epistemological knowledge through, that was fully intact in the language itself. And I kind of liked it um, and, uh, and, and carried on, on with those exercises to, to gain what it is that our ancestors uh, left to us. In, and uh, through that, I started to get a, a bigger uh, sense of what our ecological responsibility uh, is or our responsibility to ecological uh, uh, stewardship. And so uh, Margaret, unfortunately, had a stroke and um, she passed away prematurely, uh, so that ended our time together uh, working. But um, uh, the Department of Anthropology asked if I would uh, take over uh, teaching a course. And so I got excited, thinking that I'd be able to contribute to the longevity of the language. But on the third week of, of uh, the course, I realized nobody ever learned to speak a language sitting in a classroom. So I started looking around the world um, at indigenous immersion methodologies and noticed that endangered language communities around the world all uh, are facing the same major issue and that's obsolescence uh, because the settler colonial societies that we interact with the most have an abundance of vocabulary that our own languages don't have. Um, and so native communities usually address this in one of two ways. The first is that they let the language die. 90% uh, of the world's languages are anticipated to, to or projected to be extinct by the end of the century. Um, and so you already heard this uh, statistic uh, on the, the, the relationship uh, indigenous peoples have to, to biodiversity. And we find this uh, immediate uh, correlation between, uh, a direct correlation between language diversity and um, uh, biodiversity. So the most biodiverse uh, places are where we find the most linguistically diverse uh, societies. And so um, when, when I start to look at the second approach, it was a pretty noble one that uh, societies are coming up with Well, as I started to realize that when you dump 3,000 plus 3 to 6,000 words, 
which is the average indigenous uh, lexicon uh, word count, um, that you deviate so significantly um, because all these terms are inherently premised on postage uh, Is the phone breaking up again? Can you hear me? Okay. We can't uh, wait and, off and a little so bit. You know, Marcus, what sometimes helps is if you turn your video off and then all your bandwidth goes to the audio, much as we look. Yeah, le okay, let me try that. Yeah, you stop video in the lower left. Yeah, there you go. So, um, yeah, that's good. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm just saying that um, once once you dump 3,000 plus words into your lexicon that's inherently premised on post-industrialization capitalist ideology, that you deviate so significantly from the ethos that our ancestors left to us in the first place that it begs this question, why not just speak English? Um, and, and so um, I... From from that concept um, emerged th this eco village. Uh, I'm, I'm mindful of the time, and I you know really wanted to open the floor at one point to to have a big conversation. But you know I, I want I want to hear Big Wayne. Um, do, do, is there is there something that um, you saw here, and and you feel like what is it what is what is it we can do? I mean, what do you have do you have a a reaction, a reflection that you want to share? About what in particular? Oh, well, you know, I mean, I know we covered a lot of ground and, and I didn't yeah. expect us to cover that much ground, but but when you hear about, you know, whether it's Dayara, whether it is um, Kenyan or, or the work that, that Marcus is doing, and, you know, they, I, I have also this moment in each time we speak of how do we keep going you know like Kenyon said you know I want I want to hear back from people I want to know how it has affected you know touch them do you have do you have something you want to share about that too because yeah, I'm sure you really you really like doing work kind of you know like it, it's interesting and I'm sorry to, to use that metaphor perhaps, but you know, you two spirit and, and at the same time mm -hmm. you're also living these two lives basically of of having, you know, your resi living fighting against uh, uh, oil, the big snake, and, and on the other hand, you know, you're living in this reservation where you have to deal with all these complexities. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like um most of the time, I prefer, you know, uh, living in resistance camps, um, and I'm, um, you know, water protector. So there's a lot of fossil fuel projects that are going on, and that continue to go on. And there's resistance camps that are all over Turtle Island, and preferring to like, yeah, I feel like learning those uh, subsistence, relearning subsistence skills, and uh, learning other people's you know, life ways have taught me a lot and made me confident in myself to be able to do the, the work that I do. Um, and so, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm glad to share space with, you know, Diana and Marcus and uh, Coyote Woman, uh, who are all doing amazing work in the community. Um, I definitely think that, you know, uh, Indigenous people, we deserve to be a you know, at the table in these conversations because we do hold on to that knowledge. Um, but then often, you know, where we're at in this current time frame, we often fit into this like victim hero happenstance where it's like, oh, these things happen and now they have all the answers. Like we don't, we, and we don't have all the answers. And we also, as indigenous people don't think all the same you know, we all come from our own distinct cultures. We all have our own different traditional life ways. And um, the point is, you know, that with diversity and when we see it in nature, that's when we're our strongest. And so involving, you know, uh, different cultures, uh, um, many different nations into a single conversation, it can be very fruitful um, because you can see many perspectives. 
and not relying on one person to speak on behalf of indigenous people or like anything like that. Like I have, I feel like I have different ideologies and even my, you know, different, you know, within my tribe and even within my own family uh, about how I feel like we can fight this climate crisis. Um, and so, but we all deserve to be at that table to be able to have these conversations so that we all can grow from it, you know? Yeah. Um, Marcus, I have, I have lots of, you know, questions about how can we support your work? Is it well, we work, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, legally sensitive things that we work with. So I'm always apprehensive to share uh, the presentation. Uh, we have so many colonial permits involved in things, but I, I, I just want to say that, um, well, we're always in need of financial support um, uh, and there's, you know, a whole colonial um, history involved with, with this need, particularly the fact that we've had to buy our own traditional homeland back. Um, that's really sucky, but um, I, I do want to make one point about, um, I, I think that for a lot of indigenous peoples, the, there's like this um, pervasive decolonial paradigm out there that like white people are going to all disappear and and we're going to like get land back or something like this and and um, you know that's I don't see any white people going back on boats or buying tickets tomorrow to Europe especially with corona but um, I feel like uh, we need to um, be requesting good neighbors as indigenous peoples uh, we want good neighbors and when I think about in the context in very rural Alabama where we live, we're looking for people that are that are practicing um, regenerative agriculture, people that are invested in regenerative economic uh, models that, um, you know, we get laughed at for, for the regenerative ag stuff that we do here because, oh, that's too much work, that's silly, that's out of some, uh, you know, crazy academic theoretical context, you know, that's how they feel. Well, that's not how my granddaddy did it, you know, but. Um, when we talk about uh, so many nutrient, uh, well, I, actually, I don't, I don't want to go down this road road because I'll, I'll get on a tangent. But, but just to say that um, we we want uh, more settlers. Um, the only way that that people are really going to to uh, reclaim their indigeneity without appropriating in other indigenous cultures that have extant uh, life ways and worldviews um, is to go out to uh, form communities and go out into the woods in the bioregion that you live can you hear me now you came back yes okay well yeah all, all that's just to say that that uh, we are seeking uh, uh, with our neighbor communities a resurgence of earth-based religion and I'm not you know trying to uh, dispel other people's um, uh, faith traditions but uh, within those faith traditions there's lots of room for a resurgence of, of earth-based components that get folks listening to the songs of the birds and the voices of the trees and I'm not trying to sound all, po all Pocahontasy and stuff like that but in our culture and, and cultures all around the world uh, people have to fast um, in the woods and communicate with the natural world in order to get this knowledge that we're very fortunate I mean our culture is not static we have to do these things still today but we're just very thankful that we also have this whole body of knowledge, of ceremonial knowledge. Um, we, we, our people conduct a green corn dance ceremony. We call it Ajilani and Bushkida every four seasons. And our prophecy is that uh, when our ceremonial fire burns out, uh, that our people will perish. And, uh, but in order to, to have this ceremony, you have to have medicine. Uh, and the medicine is a concoction of, of plants and water, but the, the medicine person, that, the one that makes the medicine, has to recite formulas uh, to make it efficacious, to pull all these uh, cosmic energies into the medicine. And so uh, if you, all these formulas that are prescribed are exclusively in the language. So if you don't speak the language, you can't make the medicine. If you can't make the medicine, you can't have the ceremony. And if you don't have the ceremony, according to our prophecy, our people will perish. So the A to D logic is no language equals uh, this, the disappearance of Muscogee people. So uh, I'm just, I, I'm just um, pointing out um, that, uh, that folks have to, um, to, to become more in, in touch with the bioregion in which they live. I mean, that's how that's how um, indigenous cultures have evolved over time is because we respond to the communication of the natural world. 
Uh, so if, uh, I mean, how long is a settler going to be a settler? Um, and really these, these ways are only going to be resolved when these so-called settlers um, reclaim indigeneity and it has to be done in a, in a just, uh, with a just social transition. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kenyon, I, you, you're reacting a lot, so please jump in. <laughs> I'm sitting here like, yes, yes, like, all, all of this, all of this is so real. Like, well, because like I'm in all of these circles and I'm so very lucky because, well, one, because my mother is a tribal chairwoman and an elder and she has been in circles where protecting sacred sites and stepping in and encouraging legal systems are amended. So California Environmental Quality Act and NAGPRA, Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, um, have been things that my mother has played a part in uh, sharing Indigenous perspectives, sharing her voice, helping shift legislation in those arenas. So even as a baby, I was with my mother, well, possibly <laughs> feeding on her while she was in Washington. That being said, when it comes to these knowledges uh, and, and, and culture sharing, the more diverse communities we have, the more beautiful opportunities of diverse perspectives and multifaceted approaches on how we could shift the world and be the change we want to see is because, well, from as simple as this concept of othering, be like as, as, as a, as a two-spirit female-bodied being, um, being the only person in the room, being the only woman in the room, being the only queer in the room, being the only person of color in the room. Mm. Um, I have realized that community members that I gravitate to that have amazing wisdom to share have also worked those muscles out when they were the other in the room. And sometimes mm. it's the other end, the, the only Europe, uh, person of European ancestry in the room of indigenous people. And they share amazing life lessons and I'm sitting here like you know what we need this diverse cultural awareness because culture sharing is where it's at <laughs> um but even in this like I'm in a lot of these circles from ecosystem restoration camps to language revitalization conferences and gatherings to um well I Indian Canyon is off the grid and it's mm. it, it's really close to Pinnacles National Monument and I'm struggling my tail off trying to well, be all the things. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm hitting the ground running in, in seeing this amazing work that my relatives are doing and I'm inspired by them and I want to do all the things. So I'm taking on multiple projects that any one individual should take on for their lifetime. <laughs> and right. I'm attempting to hold space in many arenas because I have lovely big shoes to, to step into footsteps to follow so to speak and make my own trail as well but honor my matrilineal lines legacy and I am part of like archaeological uh, societies that is <laughs> presence does not equal consent <laughs> I encourage more indigenous communities to be uh, community members to become part of archaeological circles so we are part of the conversation as uh, as our relative voiced, um, many times indigenous peoples are, people lean to them saying, tell, tell us how, what the future, tell us what the future holds or what are ways to do this. And like, we're all knowing. However, when we offer insight like language revitalization courses, capacity building to empower indigenous peoples to be in the conversation, sometimes being in the conversation means we have to become an agency or a business because, well, many state projects do not um, acknowledge individuals. So the Native people need to become a business to then be considered to be part of the conversation to then be consulted with. Um, many times with consultation efforts, Indigenous peoples are the last to be thought of, i.e. the, like here in California with CEQA, California Environmental Qualities Act, there's this thing called uh, EIR, environmental impact report and so someone who decides they want to build a building and they're going to dig and impact um, an area 
the, the tail end of that impact report says, what cultural and biological resources will you be impacting? And then it says, uh, biologically, here's the plants and animals, and then cultural resources, well, there is this one archeological sensitive site, or, oh, we didn't really find anything. Well, not many people were paying attention until not even the 80s, even like 90s even. So a lot of that area was deeply impacted, let alone ever respected or regarded as a sacred site. Ancestral remains are constantly desecrated. Village sites, sacred sites, constantly disregarded and desecrated. And here, the legal system allows us to be part of that system. Yay, it feels so good to be included. However, we are like at the end. And protocols and respectful yep. conduct and cultural competent actions would be, I have an idea of building a building. Let's talk to the native peoples of the land and let's see how we can possibly work together to benefit our communities around this supposed need. And then involve indigenous peoples of whose land you're impacting. And maybe y'all can work together from the beginning to have a mutually beneficial and reasonably mitigated process. Because most of the time, like a lot of the mitigation processes are at the tail end and it's more costly and then it leaves like sour faces. And so in all of these circles, it's just become aware that there are things that we don't know and we need to become aware. And getting familiar with truth and history, becoming familiar with the native peoples of whose land you are on, honoring your ancestry and your, your indigeneity and just start breaking down everything you've ever been taught and just questioning it just in case because there are it's from as simple as like implicit biases that we have to microaggressions that we don't even know where we're taking action on to environmental racism and I'm just excited to be around inspirational community members who are taking steps, like pushing back, not doing the, well, it's the way it always is, or it's business as usual. I'm lucky and blessed given that one, my mother is who she is, and I've been able to be raised in that environment. And then my voice, um, being, being a singer, I have been afforded many opportunities to be highlighted and be on stage. And then my personality and, and strength to um, push myself out there because for a long time I was an introvert. <sighs> so pushing myself out there and then radical vulnerability, uh, expressing the sadness, the hurt, the anger, instead of complacency, fake it till you make it, behaviorisms. Um, <laughs> yes, canyonisms, I, I, I make words up too. Um, <clears throat> And that being said, showing up in community that way, um, in that vulnerable aspect, in, in hopes that being that raw, authentic self, um, at least publicly applicable raw, authentic self, my real raw side is a little too much, <laughs> um, is a way to help the community recognize that we don't have to go on the way we currently are. Um, we can start being co-conspirators of a better world. And I, I, att I attempt to inform and educate community members around my definition of ally, accomplice, advocate. But in all actuality, we need co-conspirators to be in community together. How are we being good guests? How are we being respectful community members? And how are we taking account to how we can be accountable to how our actions and words impact the next seven generations. And I, I'm just so happy that all these amazing beings are doing badass work <laughs> in, in these efforts. And so um, if I'm going to say like any type of ask is, can I, I love help. I, I know, I know I don't know what I don't know. There are many things I struggle with. I'm neurodivergent. So I struggle with certain things. Some of the supposedly simple things um easy for some challenging for me i'm in the process of building out things but i still need help in that arena i have a patreon account it's patreon forward slash canyon and it shows a little bit of what i'm doing i uh i published a coloring book in the mutsun dialect for language revitalization efforts i still have quite a few copies so i'm selling those 
I am an artist, uh, activist, vocalist, uh, consultant. I'm doing a lot of consultation, but I'm still building out the infrastructure. I, this is the this is the teachings. Fake it till you make it. I'm still building out the infrastructure of my administrative works, which is very very challenging for me. But I'm working on bigger things for our land, and there are a lot of struggles that uh, that are currently um, brewing, and I don't have an exact ask of like contribute to our eco village intentions or contribute to this effort or that effort so um i deeply would appreciate any type of assist any type of beings who may want to reach out and connect with me i'm totally cool with however that happens um but yeah um <laughs> no solid ask uh yet besides check out the work that i do check out canyonconsulting.com and Thank you for your time. Um, I'm definitely appreciating those of uh, you who are present in this circle. So uh, thank you. <clears throat> so I want to offer uh, some lines that are in my coloring book, a uh, prayer that my grandmother taught me. Well, my grandmother taught my mother because I never met my grandmother. Um, and I also have posted this to many social media sites. Uh, so if any of you are on social media, pursue Canyon Consulting ping me a message, I'll send you the imagery of how to spell the words. But for those of you who have ever heard the uh, earth song, where it's earth my body, water my blood, air my breath, and fire my spirit, translation into the Mutsun dialect of one of the Ohlone Costanoan languages is <clears throat> pide kanama si kampation hetel kanoso soto kanoso. And in one of our uh, words of, af not quite words of affirmation, but at the end of a prayer, my mother will offer the word no son. No son means in breath, so it is in spirit. And I highly recommend, if any of you have a chance, there is the uh, Haudenosaunee words, uh, Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address. I highly recommend you look it up. I became familiar with it through the tracking project and the pattern mind uh, organization. It is a small little booklet and it is a Thanksgiving address thanking many, many things within the Haudenosaunee community. And it's a language revitalization packet. So thanking the elders, thanking the wind, thanking the sun, thanking all of these beings. In it, in, in, in part of it, you in community witness the thank the, the thankful address and then all of you share your words of affirmation or, or or that prayer so some people will say amen some people will say ashe some people will say aho in california native in my california native community we say oh like a good oh one because it works if you're ever at a california native like <clears throat> frontline movement action uh event if someone says like you, um, welcome to Ohlone territory. Oh, we are still here. Oh, and they can keep going and it works. <laughs> but at the, or when our, our community enters or exits the roundhouse, oh, for each individual, uh, depending on the, the gathering and things of that nature. So I'm just wanting to say no son in breath. So it is in spirit. Tom Sanak Kanis. Thank you. Thank you. Oh! <laughs> Marcus, big win. Last words. Be good. Be good. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so we're going. We, we're going to have one on Monday, and 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 when the following Monday. Uh, so. You know, I, I know again, you know, just want to repeat that there's, we shared so much. Um, I didn't expect it, but, but it's big, it's beautiful. Um, and I encourage every one of you to, to, to reflect and, you know, write down things that uh, um, you want to deepen or you want to bring in and thank you again. Um, you want, you know, 
yeah, uh, there, there'll be a next one. So I'm, I'm, I'm speechless right now. Um, but thank you all, love you all, and uh, much blessings on, on, on your day, unpacking all this. Um, voila. Ciao. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. <laughs>